Thanks very much, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I uh, ask your indulgence for the state of my voice, uh, which uh, is even worse than its uh, normal condition at the moment. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And if you could perhaps have summarized things to say that I have a, a bit of a split personality, uh, dual identities, uh, insofar as, uh, and this is true professionally, uh, that dual identities that, uh, in a way, keep getting forced together by uh, the press of events and also by other people's preconceptions. And the linkage uh, that I'm going to talk about today between inequality and instability, financial instability in particular, uh, is in some sense an instance of that. Uh, one of the personalities which has been uh, a primary uh, academic preoccupation for uh, now between 15 and 20 years has been an effort to improve the measurement of uh, various types of economic inequality and to do so not only on the national but uh, on, uh, on a global scale. Uh, and that's a project which got underway long before uh, the study of inequality achieved its current degree of, uh, of, of fashionability. It was, uh, uh, something that emerged really out of uh, considerations of method rather than uh, of the larger demand for the particular topic. Uh, and the other uh, aspect of this sort of dual identity, uh, which goes back even longer, about four decades, is that I've been an ambulance chaser of financial crisis. Uh, and that uh, is a, a kind of a hobby that I picked up uh, involuntarily uh, at the start of the New York City financial crisis in 1975. And I can just tell you that the circumstances, I had, I had just joined the staff of the banking committee of the House of Representatives uh, at the age of 23. And I had that temporary, I didn't even have a desk in the staff offices, but I had a temporary desk uh, in the chairman's office, the chairman being a newly uh, elected uh, to that position by his colleagues, Henry Royce of Wisconsin. And uh, I would think it must have been um, June I've been in the, uh, in the office for maybe a, week, a couple of weeks of 1975. He stopped at my desk and said, come with me. We have to go to the meeting. So we went from the Rayburn building down through the tunnels and came up, I think, in the Longworth building uh, to a room which had in it all of the uh, members of the New York City Congressional Delegation at that time. Uh, and there was uh, Bella Abson was there, for example, and uh, Elizabeth Holtzman and uh, Charles Randall. Uh, Steve Solars, uh, and uh, uh, maybe 15 others, uh, and they were all uh, deeply concerned because they had just learned that the, uh, uh, the banks which had been financing the city on a short-term basis had, were not going to renew the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, those loans when they expired, which was coming up in the, in the middle of 1976. Uh, so uh, they you know, saw that this was going to be a catastrophe for the city, and they were asking uh, the newly installed chairman of the banking committee, who was a Midwesterner, and was obviously a sympathetic liberal, but not a New Yorker, uh, for his assistance. And, uh, Henry listened to this uh, for 15, 20 minutes, and finally he looked at the members of New York, and he said, don't worry. My staff will have a plan for you in the morning. <laughs> so from that point forward, I had, to some degree, the portfolio of uh, financial crises. And the notion that financial crises were part of life was not as, let's say, uh, uh, a much of a discovery to me uh, when, if by 2007 than it was to your typical I was not part of the nobody could see it coming group uh, because it seemed to me that financial crises was something which were uh, in the Minsky tradition a uh, routine uh, feature of the uh, uh, of, of the scene and the question really was facing the, uh, uh, the, the policy maker was whether you uh, retarded their onset or accelerated it with your choice of policy uh, actions. But anyway, by and large, these two uh, sets of concerns developed along separate lines for quite a few years, but they began to merge conceptually 
uh, in the late 1990s uh, with a body of work that focused on the problem of inequality in the United States, uh, which began to become of a uh, focus of interest for the economics profession in the late 80s with the work of uh, Barry Houston and Bennett Harrison uh, and with the, uh, uh, the, the mainstream reinterpretation of rising inequality in the early 1990s along the lines of the arguments that I'm sure we're all familiar with about uh, the influence of technology and trade and so forth and skill bias technological change. Um, and I realized at that time that if I wanted to make any contribution to this, I would have to have a richer body of information, new sources of data that could be brought to bear on this. Uh, and I also realized that, in fact, it was quite straightforward, given the data-rich environment of the United States, to calculate such sources of, uh, of information measurements of inequality, uh, and that you could, in fact, uh, uh, say things that others had not been able to say because of the drawing on uh, data sources that were <laughs> basically administrative in nature rather than survey-based uh, and available on a routine basis on an annual, sometimes even on a monthly uh, basis, <coughs> which then uh, led me to uh, begin to advance the claim uh, that when you were looking at economic inequality, you were looking at phenomena that were closely tied to macroeconomic movement of inequality in wage structures in the United States. The period I was examining very closely tied to the unemployment rate. Um, and um, the movement of income inequality emerged in that work and especially in later work in the United States, which we'll see uh, momentarily very closely tied to the valuation of capital assets, which is to say that was going on in financial markets at the time. Um, and that began to be the kind of theme, the bell that I've been striking pretty much ever since, um, maybe 15 years before other people began to try to see the linkage here, uh, which I take as an instance of Galbraith's law, uh, which is that a thought in economics has not been thought until the right person has thought it. Uh, <coughs> what I want to do today is to um, present to you a body of work which led to this linkage between financial uh, regime, financial instability, uh, and economic inequality on the global scale, and led us to develop this analysis in advance of the great meltdown of five years ago. Um, and uh, to show you a little bit about what the data sources were to, uh, 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 that led us in this direction and how we just derived this particular uh, line of argument. So that's, uh, in some sense, my objective. Uh, the talk will not be about the aftermath of the Great Crisis to a substantial extent because uh, we do not yet have uh, the kinds of inequality measures that are rich enough and thoroughly integrated enough to permit us to really take that up in a convincing way. But this will give you a sense of the, of the larger body of research.